All right, folks, so we're going to start the formal portion of today's presentation, uh, and the presentation is on the 30% New York Initiative. This is not intended to be a deep dive on how to be successful with the 30% or how to find and incorporate local products. Um, we do have those trainings. We've done quite a few on those, on those, and we're happy to share those if anyone would like to see them or obviously just speak one-on-one. -on -one. But this training really is designed to be a higher level overview uh, to an audience that frankly, we haven't spent a lot of time engaging yet. Um, it's kind of been a missed opportunity in our opinion, and that's largely been uh, school administration and school business officials, though we do know we also have uh, food service professionals in the room with us here today, and we're excited for that. For our school food folks, please feel free to reach out to any of us directly, and we're going to do introductions here in a moment if you want to dive into the weeds on any of the topics that we're going to talk about. Prior to doing introductions of the team, I just wanted to share a little bit about Harvest New York. So we are a statewide Cornell Cooperative Extension team, and we do programming in three key areas. We do local food, urban agriculture, and emerging markets and crops. And farm to institution slash school is one of our keystone programs under our local food program area. And we have been supporting farm to institution efforts for about a decade now. Our team brings a really diverse set of skills and expertise. Some of us hail from the food industry sector, others from public health and nutrition, and others from, from production agriculture. I'm gonna go ahead and ask my teammates to go off mute and introduce themselves. So I'm the one there on the left, I'm Cheryl. I am the program lead for this team, and I also serve as a local food system specialist for the state. Again, this really falls under our local foods program area. And I'm going to start in the left corner, if that's okay, with, with Sandy, and then pass it off to Amy. So if you guys want to introduce yourself in the regions that you cover, that would be great. Sure. Um, my name is Sandy Menasha. I am one of the Long Island Regional Farm to School co Coordinators through the Harvest New York program. Amy is my co-coordinator. She'll go next and introduce herself. I am also um, a vegetable specialist here with Cornell Cooperative Extension and cover both Nassau and Suffolk County. Thanks, Sandy. So hi, everyone. My name is Amy Bly. I also cover Long Island with Sandy. Uh, we cover both Nassau and Suffolk. I am also, um, for the past like six and a half years, a senior nutrition educator with the SNAP-Ed program. Hudson Valley, Katie. Hi, my name is Katie Sheehan Lopez, and I'm regional from school coordinator for the Upper Hudson Valley. So I cover Duchess, Columbia, Green, Ulster, Sullivan, and Delaware counties. You're up, Christy. My name is Christy Apostolidis. I'm the Farm to School Coordinator for the Lower Hudson Valley, so Orange, Rockland, Putnam, and Westchester counties. Great. Now going to the left corner, Becky. Hi, I'm Becky O'Connor. I'm a Farm to Institution Coordinator, so I also work with institutions um, in Western New York. So I have Erie, Niagara, Chautauqua, Allegheny, Livingston, Genesee, Orleans, Yates, Monroe, and Wyoming counties. And Ontario, did you say, were you kind of, you're starting to dovetail into the finger yes. lakes a little. So if you said that, I'm sorry, but yeah, it's- I it's didn't, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, so Lindsay, do you want to go next? And Megan, if you could introduce yourself after, that would be great. So Lindsay Pasha, I'm the Ag Business Development Marketing Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension's Harvest Near team. I've been on the team over five years, um, and then I'm adding on um, farm to school work in Northern New York. And then Megan's going to go next. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Doman. I'm the farm to institution educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Essex County. I work with institutions and schools in Essex, Clinton, and Franklin counties for the past few years now. Thank you all. And you'll see that we have a couple of coming soon uh, boxes. And so we are hiring in the New York City area and the central New York area. And the central New York area is likely gonna go up into the Western part of Northern New York as well. So we're hoping to have those folks officially onboarded in the next two months, optimistically. Um, so that's really exciting. I'm gonna just jump right into the agenda. If you have questions, please feel free to just type them into the chat box. Our coordinators will be facilitating them. And of course, so the coordinators interrupt me at any point if it's a pertinent question to the topic at hand so all can hear the response, but feel free to use that chat box as well. So here's our agenda. We talked a little bit about Harvest New York, but I really just want to mention the services that the team offers. We're going to talk about what is farm to school at large, kind of drill down a little bit to the 30% initiative, talk about who receives the funds, 
highlight the application process. And then we're gonna go into regional breakout rooms and we do hope that you stick around for those. That's a chance to talk directly with others in your region, learn about things that are going on because there's really great work that's happening across the state. And then also, again, just to connect directly with your coordinator. The Harvest New York Farm to School program goals are twofold. Uh, the first is to provide direct support in procuring New York food products. And I'm gonna define that because it does have a formal definition. And the second is to develop resources, training and technical assistance to support supply chain partners. And so this is an example of a training that would fall under that bucket. The way that we do this largely is boots on the ground support. And so we have been charged by the New York State Department of Ag and Markets to provide this boots on the ground support. And so some of the services that are included under this include finding local food and farm partners, working with supply chain partners on logistics, including delivery. So we use the term farm to school stakeholders a lot, and that really includes all of the actors and processes that's involved in getting food from the farm to the loading dock. So that's food manufacturers and food processors and distributors and food hubs and everyone in between. We develop local food procurement plans and that, that'll probably make more sense here in a moment. We assist in bid development that favors local foods. So in other regions, we've been successful using geographic preference to target local food specifically. We establish farm to school promotional campaigns, New York Thursdays and or Harvest of the Month. And if you have any questions about those, they're really neat programs. I encourage you to bring those questions to your breakout rooms. We assist in securing grants to expand farm to school programming. And I'm gonna provide a few examples of schools that have been successful in securing grants to help their food service department because of their farm to school program. And lastly, we support 30% New York initiative tracking and documentation requirements. And I'm gonna scratch the surface on that a little. Honestly, we could do a whole hour training on that, but we'll just scratch the surface and then follow up with any questions after for sure. So I'm gonna start with why school meals are important, which I'm sure many of you know, but if nothing else, it's an important reminder to me and my team. They're uh, an obvious source of nutrition for students. They have been known to improve behavior, ability to focus and academic performance. And there's been lots of studies done on this. So drilling down a little bit, what is farm to school? And so there's a formal definition of this that I really like, so I'm gonna read it, it's short. Farm to school enriches the connection communities have with fresh, healthy food and local food producers by changing food purchasing and education practices at schools and early care and education sites. So that's the national definition of farm to school. And we really look at it in a way where kids win, farmers win, and communities win. And I have some cool pictures to kind of illustrate um, just those points. So kids win because farm to school provides kids access to nutritious, high quality local food. And so this picture here is a photograph of a salad bar. I think this was taken in Buffalo Public Schools. Farm to school activities enhance classroom education through hands-on learning related to food, health, uh, nutrition, and agriculture. And this is a photo of Buffalo's annual chef competition. Uh, we haven't done one in a few years um, for probably obvious reasons, um, but the chef's competition brings together students. They partner them up with a local chef and they're challenged to create a New York lunch. And through this competition, they learn life skills and culinary skills, as well as receive education on agriculture and nutrition. And it's just a really fun event. Farmers win, so farm to school can serve as a significant financial opportunity for farmers, food processors, and food manufacturers by opening the doors to institutional markets, which in New York is worth about a half a billion dollars in just the public sector alone. So this is a photo, again, of Buffalo Public Schools New York Thursdays launch, which again is that food celebration that I mentioned. And this photo celebrates the support of local grain farmers, beef farmers, urban produce farmers, potato farmers, and three food manufacturers that are within a stone's throw from the district yet never participated uh, in their school food service program before we launched this initiative. Communities win, farm to school benefits everyone from students, teachers, and administrators to parents and farmers by providing opportunities to build family and community engagement. And this is a photo of Buffalo's farm to school to you food truck, which was originally conceptualized to bring farm to school meals into the community. It debuted last October in the height of the pandemic, so it served another important role, uh, and that role was bringing hot local meals to those in the community that really needed them. 
And there are, by the way, these pictures are all of Buffalo because there's been a lot of photographs taken of the Buffalo Farm to School program that we have in our arsenal. But these types of activities are happening with our partners across the state. And there's some really wonderful examples. What is the 30% New York initiative? So this was launched in 2018. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo launched the No Student Goes Hungry initiative, which has other things in that legislation, but the 30% New York initiative was a keystone aspect of that legislation. It increases, it's an incentive that increases the per meal lunch reimbursement from 0.56 cents per meal to 25 cents per lunch. So a little more than 19 cents. And F SFAs who demonstrate spending 30% of their lunch food costs on New York food products receive the reimbursement. That's the initiative in a nutshell. New York food product is formally defined through this initiative. And this is an important point to spend a few seconds on here. There's been other by local campaigns that have defined local food as something being processed in New York. So schools buy a lot from General Mills and Barilla and they're wonderful contributors to our local economy, but they don't buy their ingredients from New York farms, so they don't qualify for this initiative. So specifically, a New York food product is a food item that is grown, harvested, or produced in New York State, or a food item that's processed inside or outside New York, comprising over 51% agricultural raw materials. And so that the way it's worded is kind of clunky, but basically, there is a tie back to the farming community and a product has to have 51% ingredients from New York. So a good example of that is a grape juice that's available. It's a Welch, it's made by Welch's, which is a national company. They produce two qualifying products. Over 51% of the ingredients in those products come from New York farms. So they are qualified uh, products. So that's just a little bit of an explanation of what that means. So what counts towards the 30%? Under the yes column are New York food products that are purchased with school food dollars for use in the National School Lunch Program. So the key words there are school food dollars and National School Lunch Program. This is very specific to just that child nutrition program, not others. The cost to process, receive, and store a New York food product made with diverted USDA foods counts. And so what do I mean by that? So there was a French fry that counted. McCain's has paused production on that. But schools could divert potatoes from USDA. So the value of those potatoes did not count. But the cost to turn those potatoes into a French fry did count. And that's because those 51% or likely more in this case of those potatoes came from New York. And so that's why that qualified. So basically anytime you're spending your school food dollars on something on a New York food product, again, for use in the lunch program, it's a qualifying purchase. And then also a la carte items that are served as part of a reimbursable lunch. So some of those products that a lot of schools have used include uh, ice cream, so ice cream from Perry's, they have a handful of qualifying products. There's a New York chip that's available. It's made with New York potatoes. Those are just a few examples. There's others, but those are sold a la carte, but served as a part of a reimbursable meal, so they count. The things that don't count are USDA foods, DOD, or pilots, so anything that you're purchasing with entitlement dollars, and also any other New York food product that's used in other child nutrition programs. So a, an easy example of this is milk. Uh, if you use milk in breakfast, most of the milk that's available in New York is by default a New York food product, not all, but most. Um, the purchases made for the breakfast program in this case would not be eligible. So I know this can be a little confusing and if there's any questions on it, um, like I said, you can put them in the chat and we can further unpack it in the regional breakout rooms. So this map pin drop successful schools. Um, so we are now going into our fourth year of this initiative. The year that schools would have been able to apply, the first year was the 1819 school year, obviously 1920. 2021 is being reviewed right now. And of course, we're going into our fourth year. The red dots denote those that have been successful for three years the blue two years and the green one year. So in the first year, seven SFAs were successful, quite a few more applied, 57 applied in 1920 and 49 in 2020 slash 2021. And it's important to note that this map is subject to change. Uh, the 49 schools are going through a review right now. 
And so we don't know that all of them will pass that review, but we're optimistic that they will. So this just kind of maps who's been successful. And you can kind of note the clusters there. The cluster in the middle of the state is tied to Oneida Herkimer Madison BOCES. They have 14 component schools that were all successful under their single SFA. We have Greater Southern Tier BOCES and BT BOCES. GST BOCES has 20 and BT BOCES has 15. And then of course, there's a lot of other dots all over the place in Western New York um, where we've had a longer standing program. We're gonna talk about why some of the other regions you're not seeing any pin drops on. Um, I'll say specifically in the Hudson Valley and Long Island, they haven't had access to New York milk. And as we'll talk about uh, here in a few moments, New York milk is critical to the success uh, in the 30% New York initiative. And until recently, those regions didn't have access to New York milk. Next, we talk about success by SFA management type. I broke it out by year again. So the first seven were all self-op in 1819. In 1920, 21 of them were self-op. And in 2021, 13 of them were self-op. And then you see our BOCES breakdown. So Broom Tioga BOCES is not an SFA. Um, they serve 15 individual SFAs and GST BOCES serves 20 individual SFAs. They were both successful last year. And I believe are, I don't believe, I know have applied for this year as well. Um, I believe they're still under review. And then Oneida Herkimer Madison is a single SFA serving 14 component school districts in central New York. And they applied last year and also again this year and still under review. And then food service management companies, we haven't um, seen any applications to date from them, but I'm really excited that some of you are in the audience today and we would love to figure out how to work through that particular management type um, should you be interested in it. So now we're gonna talk about program benefits beyond the obvious ones, which are increasing access of healthy food to students and supporting local farmers. This initiative is a procurement incentive, which plainly means that there is a financial incentive to participate in this program, namely that additional 19 cents per lunch served. And to those of us, and we're not technically in school food, but we work a lot with school food professionals, 19 cents doesn't always seem like a lot, but if I've learned anything working with school food partners, it's that cents matter and they add up fast. And I think the chart that we see here on the left illustrates that point. So reimbursement is based on national school lunch average daily participation. Um, and so you see some examples there of what an expected reimbursement could be based on sample ADPs. And in the breakout rooms, we, we pulled ADPs for most of your schools, all the ones that we had access, the data that we had access to the data. And we'll kind of run through those scenarios so you can see what your expected reimbursement might be. But you can see it's not insignificant, you know, a school with 500, an ADP would receive 17,000. And then of course that amount increases as ADP increases as well. So another benefit is state and federal recognition. So this picture highlights the winners of the 2019 Farm to School Awards, which are presented by the New York State Department of Ag and Markets and the New York School Nutrition Association. Uh, and this picture always makes me smile because these folks have just been farm to school champions for many, many, many years, long before the 30% initiative was passed uh, and still are wonderful champions to this day. Farm to school and 30% success also enables the district to leverage additional sources of funding. So these are two examples of this benefit in action. Frontier, Hamburg and West Seneca, which is the photo on the left, partnered on a grant that enabled them to purchase a new freezer and equipment to process raw whole vegetables during peak season when they were more affordable and freeze them for use later on in the school year. So that was three districts coming together and getting some critical infrastructure that they needed. And then the snapshot there on the right illustrates uh, Broom Tioga BOCES. They were able to live, leverage their farm to school success to fund a need critical to their program, which was a refrigerated truck to facilitate the logistics associated with buying local food and moving it to 15 component school districts. And of course, these assets can be used to support other needs of the school district beyond just local procurement as well. So these are just a few. There's, there's many other examples of grants that have been awarded to school food partners because of their role in farm to school. Uh, there's a federal grant that's dedicated specifically to farm to school. There's a state grant that's dedicated specifically to farm to school and a handful of others that just support it. So now let's talk about who receives the funds. In the simplest form, the reimbursement is tied to the school food authority. 
So the following scenarios will help determine which entity receives the funds dependent on how your district district's food service program is managed. So if it's self-operated by the district, and it looked like that was the majority of the folks that we have in the audience today, your food service department receives the reimbursement. If your food service is managed by a BOCES, it depends on who the SFA is. So if BOCES is the SFA, as is the case in Oneida, Herkimer, or Madison, like I mentioned, they receive the reimbursement. If your district is the SFA, your district receives the reimbursement. So those other two BOCES that I mentioned, GST and BT, they do all of the work to get to the 30%, but their component school districts actually get the reimbursement. In a food service management company situation, the district receives the reimbursement because again, it's tied to the SFA. So the additional reimbursement can be spent on anything that benefits the food service program, including but not limited to food, staff training, equipment, infrastructure upgrades, labor. It can also be used to minimize school food debt, should there be any. While the intention of the program is to spend the funds on expenses that enable the school food authority to purchase more New York food products, it's not mandatory in any way. So this is the 30% process from a very high level. And I don't want this slide to look daunting, although it might. Um, the coordinators that we have on this team and the coordinators that we have across the state that aren't on our team but are supporting many of the schools are charged to do this, this type of work. So you really have a support personnel person to help you through this. First thing that you do is you calculate what your 30% spend is using State Ed's calculator. So State Ed has a calculator that basically tells you what your magic 30% number is. And it's the only improved calculator that can be used. And we can certainly share that out after, but that's step one is what is your 30% spend that you need to get to. Then you wanna establish your baseline of current local purchases. and most of you are buying local food even, even if you don't know it. Specifically, if you're getting local milk, you're buying a lot of local food and you probably don't even know it. And so next we wanna establish your baseline of current local purchases. And then we wanna develop a procurement plan to figure out how to close that gap. So what's your magic 30%? What are you, what are you spending on local food? Usually inadvertently, especially when it comes to dairy and how much of a gap do we have to close? You want to maintain proper pa paperwork and track throughout this school year. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. You apply for the initiative in mid-August based on previous school year purchases. And so as part of the application and review process, ultimately the school food authority has to pass three tests for lack of a better word. They have to prove that the items were purchased, which is generally accomplished through invoices and or velocity reports. They have to prove that they menued it as a part of a reimbursable lunch, something that can be achieved through production records and other tracking forms. And lastly, that it's a qualifying New York food product. And we on the team have direct knowledge of what those qualifying food products are. We maintain a list that's available publicly. And then State Ed also uses New York State Department of Ag and Markets, New York State Grown and Certified, uh, program as kind of the gold standard. And there's a list of those as well. Um, so again, we have a really strong working knowledge of what products qualify and what don't. You have to go I just want to jump in real quick, Cheryl, that um, that list is just processed products, really. So you also have your local produce and things like that too, which can qualify just so there's no confusion. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Becky. So the list that we maintain is, is largely processed. It's hard to list produce because it's seasonal and it's regional, um, but produce definitely accounts, uh, accounts for this program. So then you go through a state ed review once every three years. So basically, if you haven't been reviewed in the past two years, you can expect to go through a review. So those seven schools that were reviewed in year one aren't going through a review this year because they were reviewed within the last two years. That's the more formal review. Um, when you apply for the initiative, you also submit a cover letter that basically explains um, what you purchased, how you qualified it, um, the different type of paperwork that you have for it. And that's kind of your internal, your, your initial review with state ed. And then again, if you haven't gone through that deeper review in the past two years, uh, they'll schedule um, that review with you. And that's what they're currently doing right now for year three. And then you received the increased reimbursement the following year as a part of your monthly state reimbursement. It's just automatically 
added to your pot of funds. So that's kind of the, the process, um, the overview at large. We can unpack a lot more of these and we certainly can, um, again, in the breakouts or at a later time if you'd like to. But um, again, I just wanna mention not to be daunted by this list. Um, our coordinators are working with schools right now on all of these activities um, and they're definitely manageable with support. So just some facts from successful SFAs in the 2019 slash 2020 school year. So my team, Harvest New York, partnered with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Allegheny County, and we analyzed all of the procurement data from the 57 SFAs that were successful in the initiative based on 1920. And we have loads and loads of data. Um, this is just one tiny slide. Um, but I wanted to point out that while we say it's the 30% New York initiative, and it is, and 29 and three quarters does not get you there, most of you are not starting at zero. Um, so dairy and apple purchases were two thirds of all New York food product expenditures, and it equated to roughly 20% of that 30% spend. So if you're getting New York milk, and many regions are, not all by default, but many regions are getting New York milk by default inadvertently, it's just what's available and what's most cost effective, that'll get you 15 to 18% of the way there with that New York milk. And it's why we also say that in the absence of New York milk, uh, regions have really been excluded from this opportunity. And then apples are a huge contributing factor to that as well, particularly if you're using your school food dollars as opposed to your pilot or DOD to purchase those apples. And then nearly a quarter of SFAs in 1920 qualified for the 30% on dairy alone. So you may only be closing a gap that looks more like 18 to 20, eight to 12 percent as opposed to again starting at zero if you can't get milk you're likely not going to be successful in this and if you can get milk you're starting at least at 15 percent so this this is just another illustration of that point um, these are individual spending patterns for four different sfas that were successful in 1920. the common denominator in all of them is the blue wheel that's dairy um, but you see some other kind of the, some nuance in their spending patterns. So in the first one here on the left, we see nearly 31% dedicated to fruit. So that's significantly higher than the other ones. In example two, you see the gray wheel, which is protein. So this district spent 33.4% of their 30% spend on protein, significantly higher than the other spending patterns. In example three, we see a lot of dairy, 82.3% of their 30% was just on dairy. And then lastly, we see a school district in example four that spent a lot on fruits and vegetables, over 40%. And so that was a really big uh, contributor to their 30% success. And the point of this is to illustrate there's no perfect pathway. You don't have to buy protein to get to the 30%. You do have to buy milk. And so we'll come back to that in a moment. One of the questions we get all the time is do New York food products cost more? And I'm gonna say usually, but just put a but there real quick. Some products, again, I mentioned are inadvertently New York like milk. And in most regions, if you're buying, lo you're buying local milk because it's available and it's what's the most cost, the cost effective. So the carton of milk on there is likely not costing you any more money. Some of the strategies that our school food partners have used in the past are bulleted here. And again, we surveyed them as a part of this data analysis. And this is what they told us they did to help balance the higher cost of New York food products because proteins definitely cost more money, particularly if you're getting them through entitlement dollars, they have very little cost to you unless they're going to further processing. So the proteins definitely cost um, a bit more. Produce is kind of a mixed bag. Um, if you buy it in season, it often doesn't cost more. Um, but it certainly can. Um, so again, some of the strategies that schools used were to serve higher cost New York proteins as a feature and not a staple. And so that plugs really well into programs like Harvest, or I'm sorry, not Harvest of the Month. It plugs in really well to pro, uh, programs like New York Thursday. So doing a feature New York protein once a month or every other month. You can balance higher cost New York foods with USDA foods. And there's some examples of that on the next slide. Um, we always encourage you to promote, promote, promote to increase ADP on New York food days. And a handful of our school food partners felt that their participation did increase on New York food days. These schools also do a wonderful job of prom promoting their program to their school community. You wanna spend school food dollars, um, school food produce dollars 
on local when it's in season, it is often cheaper than non-New York. Aggregating orders in group purchasing is proven to be a fruitful strategy. And you wanna forecast your increased costs to make sure that you're net positive in this effort. I mean, that's the whole point, right? As much as we are champions for purchasing local food, we certainly don't wanna encourage anyone to do it at a deficit. And so proper planning and coming up with that procurement plan with your coordinator can really help ensure that you stay net positive. So one of the other questions that we get, uh, let's see, why isn't this advancing? One of the other questions that we get a lot um, is how do I increase expenditures on local food while still taking full advantage of my USDA foods? And this is a really important question. And this is something that we ask school food directors uh, as a part of that data analysis. And this is what they told us they did. So reducing the use of commodity beef, mozzarella cheese, and cheddar cheese, and substituting it with qualifying New York brands, because we do have qualifying New York brands for those. Uh, mixing commodity and locally grown foods to bring down the cost per serving. And just a few examples of that include combining, com combining commodity beef with New York beef, topping New York yogurt with commodity frozen berries, combining frozen New York vegetables with commodity frozen vegetables, and similarly blending beans with commodity canned beans. And then other schools shifted the use of commodity foods to the breakfast program and again spent more of their school food dollars on New York food products uh, to participate in this program and be successful. Similarly, we asked how they um, how they purchased more local produce while maximizing the use of DOD and pilot. And these were some of the common strategies that emerged among successful SFAs. They use favors in pilot to obtain only non-New York produce. Uh, they use favors in the pilot to obtain produce for their breakfast programs or other school meal programs. And again, reserve those school food dollars to the extent feasible um, for local purchases. And then seasonality is really important to consider when you're planning the use of favors and pilot. And many of our successful school food directors said that they did intentional planning, right? So you wanna front load and back load New York produce purchases when they're plentiful, they're in season, they're affordable, and that's namely late fall and late spring. Uh, there's are a handful of items like our storage crops that we have year round and those crops do tend to be more uh, uh, less expensive items like cabbage and onions and apples, we have those year round. Um, but for the items that we don't really try to front load and back load those when they're coming into season. This is the end of our formal presentation